Hi gang, Rob here. It is the evening of 23 February 2016 and I have for you this evening a good old-fashioned knife review on a Spyderco knife. You might call it that little old knife from Texas. Or is it Taiwan? Hmm, <clears throat> looks familiar, doesn't it? But then again, kind of different. This will be an in-depth and detailed review of the hotly anticipated Gail Bradley Folder 2. And that's what we're looking at right here. I would like to welcome new viewers who might have stumbled upon this video doing an informational search on the Gail Bradley 2. I'd like to encourage you to Hang around, subscribe to the channel, share the video, like the video. You can expect from the Apostle P channel two to three videos per week on knives, gear, guns occasionally, a little sprinkling of the gospel of Jesus Christ once in a while. But tonight it's all about the Bradley 2. <clears throat> and no review I think could do the Gail Bradley 2 justice without comparing it to a vaunted benchmark that's right <laughs> the original Spyderco Gail Bradley and the reason I think this comparison is important is because uh, well a lot of guys dearly love the first Gail Bradley and are a little skeptical about what might come next how did they cheapen it up we might ask ourselves <clears throat> and then there are a whole bunch of other guys who really like the concept, appreciate the extremely high quality construction, but have just a couple objections with the first Gale Bradley. They just can't get past. They'd really like to own one, but those couple of things have just held them back over the years. Let's see if the second one cures those things. Before I get into characterizing the two knives, let's, uh, <clears throat> let's look at some specifications, dimensions, because there are some differences. Okay, blade lengths. Let's see, let's put them like that to compare blade lengths, shall we? If it looks like on camera that the blade on the two is a little longer than the one, that would be correct. The original Gail Bradley had a 3 and 7 16 inch blade, 3 and 5 8 on the new one. <clears throat> handle length, also a little longer on the new one. The original handle was 4 and 11 16 inches long. The new handle, 4 and 13 16 giving us overall lengths of 8 and 1 8 and 8 and 7 16 respectively. <clears throat> Blade thickness is going to be, well, it's the same. I measure, uh, I measure them both at about 117 or 118 thousandths, so probably one eighth inch stock prior to finish grinding. <clears throat> and a really important dimension, I think, on Gale Bradley's because they are purpose built designed specifically for it cutters and if we want a knife that's a good cutter it's got to be thin behind the edge and they're both quite similar um, <clears throat> the Gale Bradley 1 ranges I'm not counting the tip where both of them will thicken slightly but as I measure like here here and then here in the belly uh, between 114 and I'm sorry, between 14 and 20 thousandths of an inch with the, that 20 thousandths reading coming right here at the base. The thinnest part I've measured was right through here, just approaching the belly. <clears throat> On the new Gale Bradley 2, I found the thickness behind the edge to be much more consistent, measuring between 16 and 17 thousandths of an inch. And if you guys are familiar with modern folders, you know to find, uh, to find a uh, sort of a larger size folder uh, with a thickness behind the edge of under 20 thousandths is pretty rare. Of course, Spyderco knows they can get away with that. 
with this CPM M4 steel that both are made of. Handle thickness on the old knife, a tick over half an inch, about 508 thousandths. On the new knife, a little thinner, about 482. So about 26 thousandths thinner, and frankly, it feels like more than that in difference. Uh, and that, that thickness difference is directly a function of the thickness of the liners. On the old knife, just over a sixteenth of an inch, about 68 thousandths thick, are both liners. <clears throat> and on the new knife, visibly thinner, about 45 thousandths. Here's another little interesting dimensional difference, I think. Now let's do it like this. <clears throat> hmm, old knife on the left, new knife on the right. Can you see it? Yeah, the spidey hole got shrunk. 13 millimeters in the Gale Bradley folder and 12 in the Gale Bradley folder too. That makes me chuckle and I'll kind of talk about why. As we get into it, <clears throat> a couple things should have stood out to you there. Um, oh, by the way, 5.1 ounces on the original, 4.4 on the new one. Um, so let's talk about the first Gale Bradley <clears throat> first. Everybody loved the way this knife was made, even with its interesting liners being proud to the scales. Uh, it doesn't make sense until you grab the knife and feel it in hand in a variety of grips and you realize that old guy from Texas knew what he was doing. It was to be a mass-produced knife. Um, for the price point, it couldn't be sort of 3D machined and contoured. So Mr. Bradley gave us surfaces that made their own natural arc around the corner even though they're all sort of pointy surfaces. It works very well. It makes the edges of the knife feel rounder than they are, more comfortable in hand, less fatiguing during prolonged cutting. And remember, the knife is a brainchild of Spyderco and Gail Bradley. <clears throat> Gail Bradley, a winner of cutting contests with knives he designed and built. The man knows how to make a knife that works. So that feature, rather interesting and unique to the Gale Bradley folder. It is, by the way, carried over on the two. Still have that same liners proud to the scales feature. There we go. So that was a bit of an oddity that guys came to understand. Next is the design of the front of the handle and the base of the blade. This freaked a lot of people out. It's not a 50-50 choil, and there is very little, very little, keeping your index finger from going forward onto the cutting edge. Um, and in this age of tactical knives, that didn't make sense to very many people. Well, it made perfect sense to Mr. Bradley because he will tell you and has told us publicly, this is not a tactical knife, it's a cutter. It's a knife designed to cut, primarily cut wood, believe it or not. It's not designed to be stabbing things, it's designed to cut. Well, I think guys never quite got over that. I happen to love it because if you're in a situation where you're going with an overhand hammer grip and you're using this portion of the blade and you need to get right on top of it with your hand and really exert a lot of force, the thumb lies perfectly down the front of the scale at, with its nice little curvature and it's just made to bear down into stuff. You're not going forward on the blade. Your cutting forces are going like this. 
<clears throat> it works quite well, but it freaked people out. The other thing was this, and <laughs> this is one of two conversations I can only imagine as we made the design changes for the two. Uh, first of all, we'll talk about releasing the lock. Remember, um, 68 thousandths thick liners. We do have a relief cut, much like we'd have in a frame lock knife. In fact, this is basically a frame lock with overlaid scales. <clears throat> but there's very little room to get your thumb in. And the lock bar tension is immense on this knife. Um, and I've heard it come out of Mr. Bradley's mouth. I did not design this knife for people to sit on their couch and open and close it hundreds of times. I designed it to be open, locked, with zero chance of accidental release of the lock, and plenty of strength, so nothing you can do prying, twisting, is ever going to release that liner lock. That's what he designed, and that's what he got. But <clears throat> we live in an age where most of the market for a $160 modern folder wants to sit on their couches and open and close their knives. And they got sore thumbs, poor babies. They didn't like that. And I know I heard about it. I'm quite sure Spyderco heard about it. I'm quite sure Mr. Bradley heard about it and went, wusses. <laughs> but anyway, that was an issue. I can only imagine the conversations that led to these 45 thousandths thick liners. I mean, you know, first of all, look at them. <clears throat> look at that Bradley one, the lock bar, almost fully engaging the blade tang, all 68 thousandths of it with very little slope in the lock surface of the blade tang. That thing's not going anywhere. And then look at the new one. The locking leaf just seems puny. It does engage perfectly. The leading edge is probably over a, a little over 50% of engagement, but it's like the locking leaf is right square in the middle of the blade tang. It's really well done. It's just thinner and it has much less tension. <clears throat> um, it's still not a locking leaf that you're going to disengage ever by twisting the knife, but it requires less effort to disengage, and there's more room to get your thumb in there rather comfortably. Um, even left-handed, I could sit on my couch and open and close this all night. Um, so <clears throat> that's one discussion I'm sure that was had. You know, Spyderco's thinking dollars and cents and volume, getting the money out of that tooling, and maybe the old girl here wasn't quite paying the bills, and they thought, <clears throat> we can get a whole new crop of Gail Bradley folder owners if we just make the knife more fun to open and close. And it is. It's a dream to unlock and close. <clears throat> this knife... I don't think I ever carried this knife more than two days in a row because I do open and close my, my knives a lot. You guys see it on this channel, don't you? And by the end of the second day, <laughs> I was having to close it like this. <laughs> uh, now, here's it. <laughs> so that's one thing. Um, and the other, of course, being this difference right here. Much more normal, modern folder, saber grip, inspiring much more confidence not going forward on that blade. Um, <clears throat> still not designed for stabbing, but I think this grip inspires more confidence in the modern folder consumer owner than this one does. So in the design, <laughs> in the design meetings for the new knife, those are two things I'll bet you Mr. Bradley lost on. And he was probably feeling a little punky. <laughs> and he had to get a win. <laughs> now, I wasn't there. This is pure speculation. But I do remember him, in speaking of the design of the first knife, expressing great difficulty in making a folder that was his design, but accommodating this hump and this hole. 
Um, <clears throat> he doesn't think a hump belongs here on a, on a knife that's designed to cut. But he had to work it in. And the 13 millimeter hole at the time this knife was brought to market was the small hole in a Spyderco. Um, paramilitary twos were out with their 14 millimeter hole that lots of guys liked um, primarily because it made them easier to middle finger flick you could get more of that middle finger in the hole yeah and flick the knife open which happens pretty reliably unless I'm trying to look through the viewfinder um, I don't think Mr. Bradley ever liked the hole he probably would have been happier with a Kind of a straighter spine and maybe just a little tiny punched hole to you know make it a spider co so <clears throat> on the new knife a smaller less pronounced hump and a one millimeter smaller hole frankly the new knife probably flows a little better i will say one thing though i haven't practiced a lot with it but i'm having a little bit of trouble with the middle finger flick uh, the thumb flick is just a dream on this knife even with a smaller hole and then you know they all sweep <clears throat> but I think finally somebody one of the spider co guys finally said okay we'll make the hole a millimeter smaller are you happy now <laughs> uh, a couple things I do like about the new knife uh, you know what the liners are thinner no doubt about that um, it, it's kind of like, uh, does it matter if your Ferrari goes 198 or 207 <laughs> if you're only driving it on public roads? No. Doesn't matter if they're uh, 68 thousandths thick liners or if they're 45 thousandths thick liners. Both of these knives are extremely robust liner locks. <clears throat> Virtually no change in the pivot and washer system of the knife by the way or the construction I think we have the same hourglass standoffs we are missing the lanyard tube on the new knife don't know why they decided to do away with that I suppose yeah there's plenty of room if you wanted to tie a lanyard around that last pillared standoff you'd be fine this was a locating pin or tube on the original design, but you've got one, two, three shouldered standoffs plus a stop pin um, and a pivot for locating. So, not sure that was completely necessary. Looks like our stop pin shrunk a little in the new knife, too. Again, um, will it, would it be ultimately as strong with the smaller stop pin? No. Is it in danger of failing there? No. Okay, let's look at this blade a little bit before we get into going around the grips and seeing which one we like better. The original <clears throat> normal spider co grinding 90 degree plunge that doesn't come sharp all the way to the base from the factory but this was actually one of my earlier efforts at getting a sharp edge all the way to the back and you can see I didn't quite have my angle right and I dug into that plunge shoulder just a little bit worse on one side than the other <clears throat> but you can get it there and you can keep that blade edge straight and sharp all the way to the back throughout an infinite number of sharpenings. Uh, the new knife, uh, they kind of screwed up. They were so close to making it better. <laughs> we have a plunge that's not, it's a little lazier. It doesn't go down to a square corner. Got a little radius in the bottom. And then they put in this little choil, which frankly isn't as long as it needs to be. Look at the factory edge. Look at the recurve in the factory edge and the little peak point back here. Uh, you know, once again, I know you guys get tired of hearing me talk about this, but 
Either start the plunge grind back an eighth of an inch or make this choil an eighth of an inch longer and then I'd have a nice beard of clean edge to get all the way to the back of and I could sharpen to my heart's content and never develop this unsightly recurve that's going to give the sharpener fits as he uses this knife. You guys know what I'm going to do. Uh, this does belong to my customer Lex from Las Vegas. I'm reviewing it on Nevada caucus night for the Republicans. I'm just going to make that choil bigger. I'm going to fix that problem before he ever gets it back. Okay, some subtle blade differences. First of all, look at the satin grind on the new one. Vertical grinds in the hollow, horizontal grinds on the flats. On the original, the satin isn't as refined and it's all vertical, although not quite in the same exact line as you can see. I think the new one is more handsome. Um, now, were it not for this recurve, this is a much straighter main portion of cutting edge, much more in line with the handle, whereas the old knife, the cutting edge was sort of angled into the work this way a little more. You know, kind of hold that handle parallel to the camera, and you can see how the belly dips down from the base of the blade. On the new knife, it's almost straight. Uh, I, I kind of prefer this as a cutter. <clears throat> but the extra blade length is welcome. Um, I guess it doesn't quite have the belly that the old knife had. Not a whole lot of difference, but... It's there. Looks like the height of the hollow grind is almost the same in both knives. <clears throat> I kind of I kind of like the blade on the new one, even though the angle of attack, you know, with that that downturn belly portion on the old knife, I like better. The overall blade shape, I think I prefer the new one. <clears throat> now let's look at grips. The new knife is set up for right hand. Um, tip up carry mine my old first generation knife is left tip uh, left hand tip up and they're all going to be four way positionable clips uh, by the way before I move on this uh, flaw and it is a flaw in the edge grind at the base um, it's present in every knife I've seen in videos or seen pictures of and it's present in the only one I've had in hand so I think it's present on all of them. At least every one I've seen. And I've looked. I've looked for that on every picture I've seen, and I've looked at a lot of pictures. Okay, grips, saber grip. They are different. The old knife is a little more comfortable in hand because of its girth. Um, if you were going to stab somebody, I like the new knife better. But if I'm cutting with that grip, it's easier to present the belly to the work with the old knife, just more comfortable. Uh, in the hammer grip, again, um, I'm going to say the old knife's a little more comfortable, and again, just because it fills the handle a little better, and because I can so naturally come up on that handle, it's not quite as natural, it's a bit more of a reach for the thumb on the new knife. If I'm back with my thumb on the handle, on the scale, um, I don't know, call that a draw. Let's go to the draw cut grip. If I'm back a little bit, they feel almost the same. That, that thickness difference doesn't really seem to mean as much in this grip. In the vertical draw cut grip, 
uh, old knife much better. Overhand pinch grip, different. Uh, it would be a draw, except again, for that downward angle of the blade on the old knife. Just a little more natural cutter. Let's see. How do they carry? I'll stick these in my pocket just a minute. Old knife, uh, it's always kind of there. Here, while I'm pocketing them, look at my Sabenza for a minute. I don't know if you notice that thickness difference so much in pocket. It's there, I guess. Both of them are kind of pocket hoggy, though. And the point at the end of the handle sort of gets you going into the pocket on both of them. The clips are identical. They're both the stunning PVD coated sort of hourglass shaped spider co clip. One of my favorites. <clears throat> Here's what's cool about it. Which knife is brand new in box and which knife is four and a half years old? with quite a bit of pocket time. Can you tell? No, you can't. Golf course clap for Spyderco's PVD coated black club. In fact, I'm not so sure the four and a half year old club doesn't look better than the new one. <laughs> Love that clip. Uh, and then we've got our good old G10 with carbon fiber veneer overlay scales um, I've always kind of loved them a lot of guys have crabbed about them because they're not carbon fiber through and through well especially on these knives my friends um, you're not getting any benefit of added strength if that scale were solid carbon fiber um, do you think maybe they have enough steel in them I kind of do Here's my dilemma. You know, these are both sort of uh, highly specialized cutters, purpose-built cutters, um, both with a rather, you know, tough but not particularly carry durable steel. CPM M4 will rust. I don't know if I come in for some macros if you'll be able to see. And I think if you look right next to the Taichung Taiwan signature, you can see some very fine black spots. Now, I live in, I'm telling you guys, you got to really look for them. I live in northeast Indiana. It is not a particularly wet climate. It's not a particularly salty climate. In fact, it's not salty at all. We have some humidity in the summer, but, um, and if I carried this knife a lot when I was cutting the grass, sweating a lot, maybe I'd have more, <clears throat> more spotting or even some rust. But I don't do anything special to take care of my CPM M4. I don't, you know, wipe it down with oil when I put it away. I wipe the fingerprints off of it, I fold it up. Put it in my safe closet uh, in an air-conditioned, heated house. Um, I don't think uh, M4 is the rust magnet that people think it is, but I know if you live in a coastal climate, it probably is. Uh, but anyway, do I need two so similar knives, uh, sort of highly specialized with a finicky steel? I don't know. I, I really don't. And. Um, I'm, I'm never selling this, so do I need this? I don't know. For sitting on the couch opening and closing it would be nice. <laughs> um, 
for making for carving race cars out of blocks of pine, um, I think I prefer this. Here's the thing, though. <clears throat> Not only did they make it more user friendly, let's say. Not only did they make it more marketable, let's say, they also made it less expensive. I don't know, I haven't checked the price on the uh, first generation Bradley in a while, but it seems to me they generally run in the $160 to $170 range. These new ones, um, I think $137.97 seems to be map pricing from Spyderco to its retailers. I found them on uh, GP Knives and Blade HQ both for that exact same price yesterday. So that was February 22nd, 2016. And al although it's lighter and the liners are thinner and it might not be ultimately as strong, it is not a cheapened up knife. Not by any means. So if we can save 25 bucks on this second generation, right out of the gate before the tooling's even paid for um, I'm saying that's a big gift to the knife community from Spyderco nice piece of work and I only have one complaint just one complaint grrr oh by the way why do you guys like to see this too <clears throat> out of the box haven't touched it no strop anything look at that of course that's not as sharp as it's going to be when it goes home it's pretty good I don't think it'll push cut it almost wants to Ooh, almost almost I had to help it a little that's pretty good. Not too many, not too many production knife companies, other than Spyderco, that can send a knife out that'll do that. Very nice, boys. Very nice. Nine and a half out of ten, let's say. That is all for this one, my friends. Time to go see who won in Nevada. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And remember the word. And Alexis Gail Bradley Folder 2 are sharp, even from the factory.